Welcome back to The Small Holding. This is our series on renovating our property. We're lucky enough to have this beautiful cottage, some land and a range of outbuildings. Today I'd like to show you what it took to get the dilapidated outbuildings which came with the property into a working order. So join me. Hi, my name's Fiona. In part one of this series, we covered the restoration of this beautiful cottage that we are privileged enough to call our home. In part two, we covered the restoration of our land. And if you haven't watched it, please do have a look. The land drainage we had to put in, and when we came here, we had a septic tank with a soakaway that ran uphill, which was delightful. We also have a range of outbuildings. We have a barn steading, we now have two greenhouses, and we have a bonus building, which we didn't realize we had when we moved here, but I'll get to that later. Our main outbuildings are our barn steading, and that's made up of four separate buildings, but they were in a very, very poor state when we bought the property. So let's have a look at where we started. When we first came to the cottage, we were lucky enough to have a range of outbuildings. On the right of this photograph, you can see the front of our cottage. The set of buildings directly ahead is not a neighboring property, but our barn steading. Although this photograph was taken roughly one year after we bought the house, so the garden and cottage actually look half presentable, the barn we are looking at hasn't changed at this point. It simply wasn't a priority. It was better for us to get the house in a state that we could live in comfortably. Let me show you roughly the shape of the barnsteading. Essentially, it's four buildings arranged in this configuration. Three of the barns highlighted in blue, yellow and red are physically connected, with a fourth marked in green connected to the yellow barn by a wall that's shown by a thick black line. Essentially, there's a passageway between those two buildings. You'll notice a further set of thick black lines on the fourth side at the bottom of the picture, which again is simply a dividing wall, but it does give us an enclosed barnyard. So what did the steading look like at that time? I've got some photographs to show you. The first are taken in the direction indicated by the purple arrow. On the left is an old set of stables. The lower half of the doors has been filled in with breeze blocks, with the upper half with wooden windows. The only problem with those windows is there's no glass in the panes. The building on the right hand side did have windows with glass in them, but they were in incredibly poor condition. However, the inside of the barns, pretty good condition. The building in front has no roof at all, and there's a myriad of weeds growing out of the floor and walls. We had been told that the previous owner had had an accident. He had a furniture restoring business and something happened which caused a fire and the roof had actually been destroyed. The next photographs were taken in front of the barn with no roof in the direction indicated by the purple arrow. If you look ahead, you can easily see the dividing wall which gives an enclosed fourth side to the barnyard. On the right, we can better see the building that used to be the stables and the stable door openings, which have been half sealed. There's a wider opening in the center, which may have been a feed store area, but it's got no door installed. We've got no opportunity to use any of these buildings at this stage for secure storage of some of the equipment we'll need to restore the land. Let's move to the outside of the barn steading and on the left hand side you can see the other side of the barn that's got the glazed windows. Straight ahead is a very small barn that is shown in red in the original diagram. We affectionately now call this the brew house although it's actually used as an extended pantry to store most of the food that we've preserved on the small holding. Finally we had an additional area that we'd use as our greenhouse space and it's this dilapidated chicken pen. The shed that had been used as a coop was riddled with red mite and the structure that used to hold the chicken wire had rotted out. This makes the entire area completely useless as a chicken enclosure. You might also notice a tree on the right hand side that seems to be surrounded by a very large area of ivy growth, but we'll come back to that later. To 
To operate a small holding, we need quite a bit of equipment, which can be appealing to thieves. So our first priority was to secure the barns, or at least fully secure the barn that had been previously stables. Our first action was to take out those unglazed windows and completely block up the doors. We had a carpenter make a heavy duty door for the area that we think used to be the feed store. To lock the sheds, we added heavy duty hasps and padlocks. At the same time, we had new doors made for the windowed barn. You'll notice just to the right of the new doors is the old oak door, which clearly wasn't weatherproof and was far too short for the opening. Once they were painted, they look fantastic. We further secured the barnyard by fitting a proper gate and padlocks. Now this won't stop thieves climbing over, but it will stop them taking out big equipment without a lot of trouble. It's called the hassle factor. The last big security measure that we took was to hook up power and lighting. Now that doesn't sound like a great security measure on its own, but it allowed us to do two big things. The first was to set up PIR lights. So if anyone's walking around, those lights are motion sensitive and will ping on, which is a great deterrent. The second thing is it allowed us to hook the barn complex up to our house alarm system. And our house alarm works remotely. So if it's armed and any of those doors are opened within the barn complex, we know about it whether we are home or not. The next job to undertake was the one that we had been putting off for quite a while since we started on the barnsteading and that was to put a roof on the giant barn that had the roof burnt off. Let's just have a look at the inside of that barn. It has a huge amount of possibilities but until it's waterproof and has that roof it's of no use to us whatsoever, it just has no purpose. Finding someone to put a roof on the barn was much harder than we thought. We wanted the barn to be low cost but practical, so a full tiled roof was prohibitively expensive, which also meant that most specialist roofers weren't interested. On the other side, general builders that quoted wanted to put up corrugated plastic, which might have a compromised lifespan, but would also heat up the inside of the workshop like a greenhouse, making it virtually unusable in summer. We were clear that we wanted metal sheeting, but found that none of the builders that we contacted were willing to research and source metal sheets. That's because their standard suppliers didn't deal with them. In the end, I did the research myself and sourced the sheets. A local general builder was then recommended to us and he helped us with the fitting. Now he did recommend that we inserted some corrugated plastic sheets on one side and that's just to give us some extra light within the workshop. We decided to keep the large door openings within the barnyard. There's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that this barn is a workshop. We're not storing expensive equipment in it, so security isn't the biggest issue for us. The second thing is the large door openings mean we can take in big coops, we could take a car in, anything we needed to work on, we could get through these double doors. Rather than solid doors, we decided to put corrugated plastic up. As I've said, security isn't a big deal for this barn. So it adds extra light and it makes things easier to work on. Of course, all of this only works if it's daylight hours. So for nighttime working, we added electric lighting. Strangely, we weren't the first people to use the workshop. A good friend of ours who has some vintage vehicles had to have some essential work carried out in his own garage. So he asked if he could store two of his cars inside the workshop for a short period of time. Of course, we were happy to oblige. Now the workshop is in regular use and it's completely invaluable to us. Once the construction phase was complete, so that meant that the buildings were secure and watertight, we were left with very, very practical units that did exactly what we wanted them to do, but they looked pretty awful. The old stable block had this mix of 
brick and breeze block, which was unattractive. And the windowed barn had bricks which were starting to get a little bit tired and old. And if we didn't do something, we would have to replace a lot of those bricks in the near future. Two separate builders recommended that we think about putting render on the barns, which would allow us to paint the barns in a consistent colour. It would protect the older bricks in the windowed barn, but it would also mean that the breeze block and brick mix on the stable block would be disguised. After a lot of discussion, because we had some concerns, we decided to go ahead. It has made a huge difference to the barnstead in. It does look fresher, it does look more attractive, and I'm less concerned about the brickwork on the windowed barn now. Moving on a few years, and this is how the barns look today. We've clearly made great use of this gable end planting area and I've got rhubarb in here and fig trees. I've also got my blueberries and cages here. But fundamentally, these buildings have moved from insecure and actually useless to incredibly secure and very, very, very useful. So let's move on and have a look at the greenhouses. Greenhouses didn't exist when we came to the small holding, so we had to look for somewhere to build them. And the ideal site was the site of the old chicken enclosure. It was south facing, so it would maximise the amount of sunlight available for those plants in the greenhouse to grow. Before we could put up any new structures, we needed to remove any old structures from the site. The first thing was to get rid of the old shed that was riddled with red mite. There's a horrible little blood sucking insects, which can be quite nasty if you do have chickens. The second thing was to remove those posts which held the chicken wire in place to stop the previous owner's chickens flying out. Once that was done, we could start thinking about what we wanted in their place. Initially, we looked for one large greenhouse. But what we discovered quite quickly was that it was cheaper to buy two smaller greenhouses of half the size than one large greenhouse. So in the end, we opted for two matching greenhouses of eight foot wide by 12 foot deep. We live in South Lincolnshire in the UK, which has very, very high winds. So what we decided to do is we wanted to secure the greenhouses to the ground and that meant putting a concrete base in that the greenhouse would be secured to. We also decided that we wanted the opportunity to plant plants within the greenhouse straight into the soil. So that meant not a solid concrete floor throughout the greenhouse but just a concrete foundation to hold the greenhouse in place. Once all of that was done and the concrete foundations were in place, we could start construction. Very quickly the base was put in place and that was screwed down very, very tightly to that foundation. From there, the sides very quickly went up and soon we had two very large greenhouses ready for use. Over time we found the decision to put in two greenhouses has become a very, very practical one. It started clearly as an economic decision, but it has meant that, for example, in spring, when some plants are being grown on a little bit further and other plants need extra TLC to start and germinate, we can have one greenhouse heated and another one unheated. We can move all the plants from one greenhouse to another greenhouse so that the the greenhouse with no plants can be scrubbed down and sulphur bombed so that any nasties are all killed, ready for a new season to start. It means that we can reduce our risk of disease in some plants. For example, blight is a big issue with tomatoes. So this year we've got tomatoes in this greenhouse. Next year, they'll be in this greenhouse. So if there's any blight spores at all, in there, they won't get to next year's crop. I'm very pleased with what we've achieved here. Let's move on to that bonus building.
let's go back to that picture which showed the old chicken enclosure when we first came to the property and on the right hand side there's an old tree and a load of ivy which is growing up it spilling out at the base i started to cut all of that ivy back and got a fantastic surprise Hidden underneath was an old garage. The doors had fallen off and the structure itself wasn't brilliantly sound, so I wouldn't dare put a car in it, but it does make a very good log store. So now we have a bonus building to store all of our winter logs. And there you have it, the renovation of our barns, the building of the new greenhouses, and of course, the discovery of that extra building that we didn't even know that we had when we bought the property. In the next programme of the series, we're going to be looking at the development of our growing space. So our orchard, our vegetable garden and our fruit growing areas, including our big fruit cage and smaller fruit cages. If you've enjoyed this content, take a moment to give me a thumbs up below. If you're not already a subscriber, take a second to do that and click the notifications icon. You'll get to hear of any new videos as soon as they become available. If you've got any questions for me, leave them in the comments section and I'll get back to you as quickly as I possibly can. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.